Can we bow in prayer, please? O oh, Father, have mercy. Wash me in the blood of Christ. My only hope of God having mercy on me. As base as I am and weak as I am and as despised as I am. And rightly so, Lord, I agree. At our best, we are just unprofitable, unworthy servants. But we all bow before thee now. And we know that without thee we can do nothing. Our expectation is in thee and thee only. For no man can change us. And we can't change ourselves. We've learned that, but we look to God from our hearts that are willing for God to change us. And that's repentance, not to change ourselves. That's ridiculous blaspheme. But to want God, to seek God, to allow God to change us. Come, our God, and change our hearts to the degree we will allow thee to speak to us. In Jesus Christ's name, Amen. Hebrews 9, 27 It is appointed unto men once to die. But after this, the judgment. God promised or God lied. If this doesn't happen to you, if you've not prepared to meet with God, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this God says, or God lies, the judgment. Judgment. Terrifying. Revelation 20, verse 10. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. I saw the dead, small children and great, grown up, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to his works. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, though those hands for all eternity will bear witness that he tasted death for every man, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, who gave himself a ransom for all, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Oh, it's a fearful thing to fall into those hands that bear the marks that he tasted death for you, unless God lied. There's no mercy in those hands that died for you if you have not prepared to meet with God his way. Once you die for all eternity, you can scream every second as no human has ever been able to scream because no human has ever known anything of the taste of hell, this side of hell, that even could compare. God will show you no mercy. No man can come from there. No one can go to them. 
there is a gulf fixed. Christ said, or Christ lied. The smoke of that torment ascended up forever. God promised. Torment forever. I am tormented in this flame. Jesus said, the man cried in hell. And then for eternity in the lake that burneth with fire brimstone. For hell is plunged and all in it. Judgment doesn't start after the great white throne if you're not prepared to meet with God the moment you die. You're in hell. You're judged. If you're without Christ. Terrifying. Second Thessalonians 1 verse 8, he will return in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will return in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction. From the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. Jude 14, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince, let's remind and bring to remembrance all that are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, blasphemous things they said in their arrogance against God, which ungodly sinners have spoken to him. I saw a wicked man just a few weeks ago, doing things and screaming at the top of his voice that people within all the whole circumstances of the neighborhood could hear him in the middle of the night screaming in the most evil, evil thing. And one of his ungodly friends began to weep and said, have you no fear of God? God, he said, and he began to blaspheme about what he thinks of God and carried on his wickedness that many were aware of Brazenly, oh, God will remind them of all their hard, ungodly speeches, statements, that they have ungodly spoken of him. There is judgment. But, right now, as we read of these fearful things, never forget, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Beloved, it is the love of Christ that constraineth us. 2 Corinthians 5.14 It is the love of Christ that constraineth us, that drives us. We're driven by the Holy Ghost. It constrains. You see Proverbs 11.30 says this, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. He that winneth souls is wise. There's something of the wisdom of God attached to him, not if he gets degrees through a university and a faculty of blasphemous people who undermine God's word, who will be judged and spend eternity in hell, though it's a theological seminar, the day any man opens his mouth with one statement against this book's authority and divine inspiration, he is going to hell, don't doubt that. Professor, you're going to hell the moment you touch this book. You all have no right to preach or teach. And any unsaved people would allow you to teach them. But when you're right with God, you win souls. This is wisdom, not academic achievements. This is the wisdom God will not despise, though men esteem you and fear you through all your academic abilities of Hebrew and Greek that sends you to hell, brother. No, sorry. Soul, not brother. The fruit, I love that, of the righteous, those who are rightly related to God, the moment they're rightly related to God, God says is a tree of life in this world. He explains that, he that winneth souls. You cannot be right with God and not be a soul winner. It is utterly obnoxious. 
you cannot be rightly related to God. The evidence, when you see the word fruit, the closest you will ever come to what God is saying is the evidence that you are right with God. Sir, you will win souls. This will take place in your life. It is sacrilegious to say you're right with God and then to walk past sinners and say Christ dwells in you who tasted death for them and he doesn't drive you to speak. He that wins souls is wise. Malachi 2, God sends forth preachers who will turn many away from iniquity or they not sent from God. Daniel 12, 3, that turn many to righteousness. These are the men who will be honored by God throughout eternity, who handle God's word. 2 Corinthians 5, 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. At the moment you are truly right with God. You are given the ministry of reconciliation. Once you reconcile, the next verse cries out, then you have won Thing to live for. You have the ministry of reconciliation once you know how to be reconciled to God or you've never been reconciled to God or you're totally backslidden and a complete grief to God and need to see God with Psalm 51 because your life must be sinful in your backslidden evil state and then when you have cried to God in repentance then shall I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. But until then you are still in your sin, David. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Do you know what that means? As though God did beseech you by us. As if God himself is speaking through us. When you're right with God, that happens. Uh, men become conscious. God is speaking to their hearts and they become fearful. Through you. Or oh, you are not right with God. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you, beg you, implore you by us, through us. We pray you in Christ's stead. That is staggering. As if it was Jesus Christ himself who died. Be reconciled to God. I died for you. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. But don't tell me you're not an ambassador for Christ if you're saved. If you've been reconciled to God, William Booth, the great general of the Salvation Army. Brother, if you're not in that army, I don't care if you're a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Mennonite. Not Booth, the man you're following that started this great movement. But if you're not in the Salvation Army, I doubt you're saved. Booth cried out, Oh God, oh that God would hang every Christian over hell for one minute. And I believe the old man, as the old man with his flowing gray hair, stood saying this toward the end of his life, frail at that last great convention. He wept aloud as he cried this. Oh, that God would hang every Christian over hell for one minute. The whole world would be evangelized within a few weeks. In 2 Corinthians 5.11, Paul cried, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, We persuade men, you know it, do you persuade men? When did you last persuade anyone in such a way they had to come? To flee from the wrath to come. 
Oh, I will become all things toward all men. I'm willing for that, God. If by any means I might win some, I don't care what the cost. C.T. Studd said, Livingston said, Hudson Taylor said, I will become all things to all men if by any means I may win John for Christ. I would seek the fearful proud with great compassion, knowing this terror of God. I would persuade, I would seek to reach the fearful proud and that is why men are going to hell. I would seek to reach them with great compassion. My wife, Jennifer, her father is one of the godliest men that ever lived in history. Don't ever doubt that. And thousands would say amen across southern Africa if they were here to hear me. Who walk with God through his life will stop the way God used him. He said something that is staggering. How as a boy, he suddenly was in a predicament in a lake. And this boy, Jenny's daddy, was drowning, swallowing water, and trying everything he could to stay afloat. He said he became numb. All he felt was a numbness in his head, and he was about to drown. But he would not cry for anyone to help him, to save him. And he said, through pride. Even if he died, he was conscious that he was not going to cry for help. be saved through pride. Someone became aware that this boy is going and somehow got to him. And but he said for years daily he would remember somehow the fear gripping his heart that through pride he was willing to die rather than cry for help. That is staggering. That is staggering. Not everyone about to spend eternity in hell will ever cry for help. Be careful. I will seek the fearful proud with great consternation and compassion because I know the terror of the Lord. I will persuade them somehow. O oh, Jude 22, of some have compassion, making a difference. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Have compassion. Others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Oh. I would study to show myself approved when I'm right with God. I would study this book from that moment to show myself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, that I might win any, I will do anything, I will become anything, I will go to any means if I may win some. I will study to show a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. We knew a lovely family, seven boys, but the youngest was the darling of the home, Philip, Pitao. Jenny and I loved them as a family. On Christmas Day, he decided, because they were having this time around the lake on their farm, all the brothers and everything, the grown-up brothers with their wives, and, but Philip decided to dive into that lake to swim to the other side. The mother said, no, he'll never make it. 
she commanded one of her sons to go in and help him. Fetch him. He dived in. He tried to catch up. He did. And Philip couldn't make it. And as he was sinking, the brother tried to redeem him, to save him. But Philip was fighting. You see, you fight people who are closest to you, even if they're trying to save you. You put them in danger. And that boy, because he would have drowned with his brother Philip, had to let his brother drown. He never recovered in his sadness that came on him that he had to let his brother drown. You see, we need to study this book desperately to show ourselves approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. When people would pull you down, Jehovah Witnesses would destroy your statements and everything you stand for, and others in this world with all the intellectualism. You need the answers. You need, you see, the righteous studieth to give an answer. That's from God. You study to show yourself approved under God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, that has to withdraw, drown. Because you don't have the answers. So you let them go to hell because you couldn't. You aren't prepared. You aren't strong enough. Oh, be careful, soul winner. Be careful that you're ready, that you don't waste time with rubbish and trash. Oh. If a blind man was walking toward the edge of a cliff, any person with any sense of responsibility or conscience would cry out to him to stop. If a blind man was walking toward the edge of a treacherous cliff, any person with any sense of responsibility or decency or conscience would cry out earnestly to stop him. Ah, the blind leaders of the blind won't, though. At least they're going the same way. If a professing Christian, even if he is an ordained preacher, has no urgency and compassion to the lost, it is tragic evidence that he himself is lost. If a professing Christian, even if he is an ordained preacher, has no urgency and compassion toward the lost. It is tragic and fearful evidence that he himself is lost. A lost soul. How can you believe? Souls everywhere around you are going to hell and not warn them. And retain your testimony. Actually retain your sensibilities. It's not possible. David Livingston, he cried, you're either a missionary or a mission field. I believe him. Charles Spurgeon cried, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. I believe him. I believe him. Spurgeon cried from his pulpit in London, I would count it a high privilege if I might die this morning in this pulpit. If that death could redeem your souls from hell. Paul said the same in Romans 9, verse 1, I say the truth in Christ I lie not, my conscience bearing witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I would wish that myself were a cost from Christ. I'm willing to be cursed by God for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh for Israel. There is such a compassion that drives you to souls, brother, that it is uncomprehendable what you will become for God for souls like Moses crying out 
when God would strike his people dead. Blot me out of thy book. Let me be perishing for eternity. If you would do that, have you any sense of responsibility? Have you any sense of compassion that drives you, that drives you to souls? Oh, John Wesley, the evangel of a burning heart, was asked by some preacher, why does God use you so greatly? He looked at him for a long time and instead of a preacher is ablaze and burning for God, others will come to see the fire. One of Wesley's biographers called him a man out of breath pursuing souls. Will anyone say that of you before you die? On the grave of Adam Clark, an early Methodist scholar and protégé of Wesley, are the words, in living for others, I am burned away. These men died in their thirties with fear. You can't believe how they poured themselves out for Christ, even for your land. For souls, the word sacrifice is not in the vocabulary of someone who is right with God. It is privilege to give your life for the lost if you're right with God. Whitfield, Whitfield cried out, it is a mercy we have not seen hell. It is a mercy you blame us for calling after you, for spending and being spent for your souls. It is easy for you to come and hear the gospel, but you do not know what nights and days we have with pangs in our hearts as we travail in prayer till Christ be formed in your souls. O oh, men, hearken to God to save you from the hell you face. No wonder God used this amazing Calvinist. I would bypass a million Wesleyan Arminius to hear that Calvinist. Why aren't you all like that? Why? You fight for doctrines, and for God's sake will you fight for souls? Or wasn't he good enough? Your adversary lays the chains of death upon you. You are every moment in danger of being seized by the formidable justice of God in eternal burnings. If you die unpardoned, you are sent among devils and demons, damned unto torments for eternity. You will undergo this punishment, for God is. sinner what must I do to be saved you cry knowing the terror of the Lord I persuade you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved or he stands for Cotton Mather 1615 to 1691 a mighty Protestant Oh, give me the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no disappointments tire, the passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sink to be a clod. Make me thy fuel flame of God, Amy Carmichael. It is impossible to evangelize the world it is possible to evangelize the world in this generation if the church will but do her duty. The trouble is not with the heathen. A dead church will prevent it. If it is prevented, why should it not be accomplished? God will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. The resources of the church are boundless. 
Let the will of God be brought into line with the will of, let the church be brought into line with the will of God. And nothing will be impossible in our reaching the lost of this world. John Griffith, John, the great man of God who staggered that continent where there's such darkness. Oh, God give us preachers again. God give us preachers again who are men of old, men wondered at. Men wondered at, Zechariah 3, verse 8, men valiant for the truth, men who have hazarded their lives for Christ. God, give us such men. Preachers, Jesus said these staggering words to his disciples, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. What a warning, Luke 10, 3. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. That is something we need to all pray about. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Isaiah 50 verse 4, The Lord hath given me the tongue of the learned. That's when you have been given anointing by God, that I should know how to speak. A word in season to him that is weary. Oh, listen to these words. Not like Job's three theological friends. Huh. His doctrine was perfect, utterly amazing. I mean, you wouldn't get anybody that knows more about the mind, the understanding, the things of God. You couldn't really touch them on anything they said. Doctrinally, they were absolutely geniuses. People who really had pondered and meditated and discussed in length through life to come to the conclusions they knew about God in that time. The first book ever written in the Bible was not Genesis. This was written before Moses, Job. These men had theological understanding that is staggering. The tragedy is it was correct doctrine but wrong address. And so the wrath of God hovered over them. You can have every answer in the Bible, but if it isn't in season, be careful. That I should know how to speak and have the discernment to know when to not rebuke a man. But God will rebuke you eventually. And if you don't stop, he'll serve you and bury you and your ministry. A word in season. He had given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He waketh, wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the learned. Oh, that's someone who really does ponder the word of God and ponder the heart of God. The Lord God hath opened mine ear. That's revelation. He revealed this secret to the servants, the prophets, God says. He gives revelation. He gives discernment. He gives understanding. He gives his heart. For his God doth instruct him to discretion and doth teach him, Isaiah 28, verse 26. This word discretion is something that unless you learn it from God, I don't care if you can quote the entire Bible backwards, you will be used of the devil. Discretion, sir, takes away the sharp edge of your tongue when it isn't meant to be shot by God, makes you shut your eyes and your lips concerning all the hundreds and thousands of scriptures you can quote to a man if that isn't what that man needs to hear. If you lack this discernment, if you lack this discretion that God only can give you, you will do damage to every soul you come near. And God forgive you if you're unteachable. You will make people run to hell from you rather than be confronted by you with all your knowledge. His God doth instruct him to discretion. If you lack that, every soul that comes near you is in trouble. In trouble. And I pity them. I pity them.
Christ warned his disciples, I send you, oh, let me tell you something. I worked with a young man, he's dead now, and I've never said it before his death. An evangelist who could have turned this world back to God. Don't doubt this. His knowledge of this book, the giftedness he had that perhaps Whitfield was the last human on earth that had such a voice that boomed. He needed no microphone. The oratory ability, the charismatic personality, whatever it was, this man had it. But as the people just fled from him, whether he was in a home, whether he was in a convention, whether he was in a pulpit, just flee. Disgusted at his unethicalness, at his lack of discernment or even decency, the way he's preached. He could have turned the world back to God. I said to him with tears one day, don't you think you need to reconsider what you're doing? Brother, if everyone's fleeing from you, if everyone, even the godly, are grieved, isn't it time to seek God that you might be doing something too harsh, too cruel, too unethical, with all your knowledge, all your giftedness? No. Don't ask me to compromise. If people are offended, it's impossible, but that offense will come. So he quotes a lot of scriptures to defend himself. What happened to him? Well, he was thrown out of our mission. He did such damage. And let me tell you something. You have to be pretty bad to be thrown out of our mission as a preacher because they have incredible patience, people like me. What did he do? Every movement he went to, excuse me, threw him out of the pulpit. Why? Because he destroyed every church he went near. They threw him out. He was run out of one movement after the other, whether it was a church or a evangelical movement, even if they were conservative. No one could survive him. In the end, what happens? Divorce, remarriage, children, Satanists, his son. They didn't want the God of this father. You see, he lacked one thing. He couldn't be taught by God how to say something in the right time to the right person in the right way. He didn't know how to keep quiet. Everybody was in the same category as far as he was concerned. And it was a God-given duty. And you know what he did? Destroyed himself, destroyed his ministry, and I believe sent people to hell. Never come near God because of the way he gave truth. Be careful. His God doth instruct him if he allows him to discretion. If he can't, heaven help anyone who comes near you. I send you out as sheep among wolves, God says. Beware. Beware, he says, of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Now, this in the religious sense really places a person in a terrible category. They don't only teach error, they oppose you vehemently as enemies of God and the cross if you preach truth. They oppose you and try to destroy you. This is what God is speaking about. Not everybody in the ordained religion of God then or now. With sheep's clothing. Oh, they just dressed perfectly. You know, this is where real thing. No. Is a prophet from God. Trust me. Ravening wolves. That will hurt you. Jesus was despised, the Bible says. That's staggering. He was rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was despised, he was rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now Christ said to his disciples and therefore to us who would follow him, if they did it to me, they would do it to you. If you preach my words, 
My father-in-law once looked at me when I was being exalted. Ha! Huh. Please don't think I'm proud of people who do that. You want to see I've agonized at some of the things people say before I stand up and I look up and read. Who is he talking about? <laughs> that he says it's about, that's not true. Don't blame me. But my father-in-law, when I was a younger preacher, many years ago now, looked at me and said, Beware, Keith. Today they cry, Hail. Tomorrow they cry, Crucify. I'm so glad he warned me because it came. It came fast. If they did it to Christ, do you think they're not going to do it to you? If you're faithful, if you do what he said, you must do preach what he said. Preach Christ in truth, not just the crucifixion, but his words that embrace the crucifixion as a result. Oh, you will be always stunned who will turn on you. You will always be stunned. The most unexpected sources will turn against you. Today, oh, wonderful. Tomorrow, crucified. It happens. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised. You think that isn't going to be you? Preachers, brace yourself. If you follow him in truth, oh, God. Give us preachers who are really willing to take up the cross and follow him. Who will not run from rejection if men despise you. Moments later after they have been praising you to the hilt. C.H. Spurgeon cried to his students. Any one of you who is not willing for and ready for persecution, rejection, undermining, cruelty. Get up now, leave the lecture room, pack your bags and go home. Because that's all you're going to know if you're true to God in the end. Oh, he was the prince of preachers the greatest preacher that ever lived oratorily wise or homiletically anyway, according to his generation, of which two million copies of his sermons were spread of every sermon he preached the day after throughout the world. Those days, no radios, no internet. Think about the impact of that man upon this world. Amazing how God honored him. And he said these words, Brace yourself, preacher. To face a life of being despised, hated, rejected of men, but always from the most unexpected sources. It is not only in Christ's time that the time will come when they think they do God a service to put you out of the synagogues and persecute you. Jesus sent his servants to go into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature, to every living being, he cried out. And don't spare yourself in the light of the rest of the scriptures, to do that while you have breath. But Satan sends forth his counterfeit servants into pulpits, false prophets, to go into all the world, and they're everywhere sent by Satan. Don't doubt this. To preach deliberate, calculated denial of this book, diversions of this book, underminings of this book, and they're in every pulpit. They're in pulpits in their masses across the world. Denying this book. Rejecting it. You know how you really want to reject it, preacher? Just don't even preach it. If you ever preached on hell, sir, what are you doing in the pulpit? If you haven't. Who put you there, God or Satan? Sir. Brace yourself, preacher. Because of raging jealousy. 
of the king Saul. And David cried out in fear, there's one step between me and death. Trust me, jealous people will do that to you. You become conscious. There's one step between me and death. Oh, the jealousy of carnal preachers. I want to write a book on that one day. Uncomprehendable. And when I, even with some of your greatest preachers in America, stood, people just turned to me and said, don't worry, Brother Keith, it's jealousy. Nothing else. They're so carnal. That would make them so turn on you. The jealousy of carnal preachers. They drove the Pharisees to want Christ dead. Oh, by the way, the only reason was jealousy. Not that they thought he was. They had to try and catch him with his words. They didn't have anything. They couldn't find anything. So they had to just keep seeking to try to get anything, to catch him with his word. That's sin. Oh, that's evil. When a man has nothing but you still try to find something to destroy him, you jealous, calm preacher. And what else would you like to call yourself? You have common sense left. Oh, it was jealousy of carnal preachers that drove the Pharisees to want to kill Christ alone, nothing else. Just as Cain killed Abel for the same reason. Many preachers, even though brothers, reek of carnality, filled with jealousy if another preacher is honored by God and men above them. The preacher whom God has blessed and who men somehow revere, though he's base and weak, will swiftly become conscious that he is one step between death, me and death. Not physical death, but to be murdered by the tongues of the raging jealousies of carnal preachers around him. <sighs> Jealousy in a preacher can drive him to murder. Not by taking a rock like Cain to kill Abel out of jealousy, but taking the tongue, which is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It's as good as taking a knife, sir, and stabbing a man in the back. You may as well take a gun and point it at him and pow, pow, pow. You may lose your testimony doing that, but God says this does the same thing, not physically. You murder a man's character. You murder a man's ministry. You murder his credibility. Do you know how? Just suggestion. Pow. Just suggest something. Christians are so gullible. Worldwide, tragically. That just the power of suggestion makes a man guilty. Full stop. Pow. You want to destroy me? Just suggest what isn't even there. I guarantee you, the whole world will say it's true. Oh, why do I know that? Because some of your greatest preachers in your land, in our lifetime, have been so destroyed that I know one who died in the gutter, who was once one of the greatest used preachers in, the, in this generation in America. And what happened? Ah, they whisper, whisperers, just whisper loud enough. For someone to hear, that's when a whisperer really is of the devil, this tongue, see. Yeah, two young Christians who were offended at his confrontation of their carnality and sin. You know what they did? They whispered something that wasn't true. When he was destroyed totally as a human, they couldn't live with their consciences. They came back 
to one of the greatest theological seminars in this nation and confessed. Now, one of them did. It was a lie. Or just suggest something. That's all. Go on! If you want to destroy me, just lie. Brace yourself, preacher. Brace yourself always from the most unexpected sources. Always from the most unexpected sources. Bill Gothard. Here I'm telling on territory, aren't I? Wow. When I first sat with him, he gave me the honor of preaching to 27,000 people in one meeting. The Sermon on the Mount, and then he spread that sermon around the world in an unusual, uncomprehendable way, to be honest with you, but he did it. I'm honored. But when I sat with him, there were these other people, Otto Kooning, the pineapple story, you know, all these men sitting there. When I first met Bill Gothard, oh, he had heard me preaching on videos and things like that. So now he calls me, flies me across from my family, the whole world to preach for him. So we're sitting there in Chicago. He said this as he sat with me. First question, Brother Keith, do you face any persecution? because of what you preach. I said, yes. Oh. But then I added these words, always so, from the most unexpected sources. Oh, he says, what do you mean? Always from the evangelical leaders who don't want that book, that standard. Even if Christ said those words. I've never known persecution in truth from an unsaved wicked man. But have I got it from the liberal church leaders of the so-called evangelical church of this day. Goth had pulled his back up. Tears welled up in his eyes. He said, do you hear that, Otto? Brother? I'm not the only one. the evangelical leaders want to destroy because of what I preach. Brace yourself, preachers. It's always from the most unexpected source. One of the godliest leaders in this world I've had privileges to sit with many, many men whose books you've read, whose sermons you've listened to. Many dead, Stephen Olfett, one after the other, the greatest preachers in the world. I prayed with them. For some reason, took me aside and wept with me. One of the greatest leaders in the world, leaders of the true evangelical church, said recently these words to me. Brother, when you refuse to compromise your stand on the doctrine and the practice of the holiness that is presented to us in this book, when you refuse to compromise your stand on the doctrine and the practice of holiness, you will face persecution from the liberal church of our day. I have had to sadly face this in my own denomination. They have turned against me the most hate me. And also, for many professedly evangelical churches that once honored me. It is going to increase, Brother Keith, so we better brace ourselves and be prepared for it. 
The emphasis now is on our church growth and personal egos, not on presenting truth, even if we don't have masses. Today, it seems men are yielding to some terrible compulsion to conform, to look alike, to talk alike, to think alike. And this is swept over like a tidal wave over the evangelical church. The liberal, compromising evangelical leaders today cry out to their congregations and their denominations, adapt or die. Within the evangelical conservative movements, there have risen leaders who are pressurizing their preachers and churches to adapt or die as a movement. But God says, be not conformed to this world. Be not conformed to this world's standards in dress, in music, in methods of gaining crowds. The crowds are not revival. Otherwise, the Jehovah Witnesses are having the greatest revival in history. <laughs> I would rather have three rows of people who are willing to listen to this book in its entirety with no compromise from my pulpit than to have this church overflowing with a hypocrites. <laughs> That's what my preacher said when I was first saved from the pulpit. Mary Peckham, famed for her book, I Was Saved in Revival, Hearken, O Daughter, sold across the entire world because of the way God saved her soul in the revival under Duncan Campbell in the Hebrides. And she was allowed in some of the greatest pulpits in the entire world, though she was a woman, as she in humility shared what God did in true revival that staggered the church throughout the world. In her old age, she said these words to me. I have become conscious that this world is not my home key. But tragically, I feel out of home in this world, most of all in the church. It is so compromised. It is so using methods of the devil, entertainment in the place of preaching. The word is buried for entertainment because all they want is the crowds. They don't want men to be saved from hell anymore. They just want the attendances to overflow. That's a sign of spirituality. We have failed the world key in this generation. We have failed. The time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Whoa. Well, let's go into that. But let's see what this man seems to apply it to. Much of the blame for our world condition lies at the door of the church. Oh, I agree. Our indifference, our neglect, our failure to cry out against Iniquity have encouraged the devil. Unfaithful preachers, modernism, formality, worldliness, unholy living have disgraced the house of God until he must, like the Savior of old, first cleanse the temple. God's house has become a den of thieves, generally. It's time for the whip of judgment. Vance Hafner. Well, his face shows me truth. For centuries, the Roman church withheld the Bible from the people and people were burned in their masses. 
if they tried in any way to have access to the Bible, it was against the Pope's infallible will. They withheld the scriptures because they would have lost what they're doing. All they wanted was money for being redeemed from purgatory. But today, Satan has another means of withholding the scriptures from the masses. Not like the papacy did, so that truth could not be there to stop them making money instead of by grace through faith alone. Now, the scriptures have been held in a very more subtle and evil way. <laughs> by forcing translations upon the masses that withhold the truth, pervert the truth. So that even the Jehovah Witnesses claim, in a very background way, to be the source of finances be behind the two most used Bibles by Protestants in the world today. because it takes away your argument if you look carefully. Do you know 80% of the new translations don't have the blood of Jesus Christ mentioned? Rejected. Don't have hell. Don't have one verse. One verse that you could honestly say proves Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Do you know they have been a Bible printed now? and it is believed to be the Bible that will take over the world, that denies Christ is in anything in the Old Testament. Whew. You think it won't be embraced by the Protestant denominations? Whew. So, we may as well be under the papacy. Truth is being held back from us now through the liberals. Oh, when they found the law of God buried in the broken ruins of the temple, this godly young king cried out for a pulpit to be built of wood and that the priests should stand and bring back the law, the word of God, nothing else. The people fell down in devastation, weeping as they realized how far they had gone from truth. Oh, the apostate, liberal, compromising, worldly church. Bring back the word of God, for God's sake, to our pulpits. It will pierce, it will cut, if it is brought back. Men will writhe in pain, or you're denying truth to the world and the church in the state it's in. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing if it isn't in that degree, sir, before anything else. <laughs> the work of the Holy Spirit to convince the world of judgment. <sighs> Unless God has done that, Moody said, nothing you claim of the Holy Ghost's work in your life is true. It is Satan. Unless the first work of the Holy Spirit is to convince the world of sin of righteousness, of judgment. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Bring back the thou shalt not. Well, how does a man know he's a sinner? How does a man know until he repents he's going to hell? So we deny all these things under dispensationalism and modern calculated carnal compromise from the evangelical pulpits down. Sir, you, it's not good enough just to preach, come to Jesus, accept Christ. No, sir, you'll send them to hell with a testimony until you hear the word repent. The man in the pulpit shouldn't be allowed. Turn or burn! Hmm. That's what they preached in the old days. You preach that today, they'll burn you. <laughs> You'll be stunned to light the matches, the fire. Embrace yourself, preacher. Embrace yourself to be undermined, to be attacked cruelly from the most unexpected sources from those in the evangelical pulpits worldwide who will not have what you preach. It's legalistic. It is separationalist, judgmental, condemnatory, legalistic lawishness. Ah. So I said to this one person, but all I did was quote the New Testament. 
Let me shock you what the answer was. Even the New Testament is legalistic, separationist, judgmental lawlessness. I'm under dispensation of grace. You're under the law. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. If it's legalistic and lawless to preach what Christ said in the New Testament, you are a disgrace with your grace. Total, total disgrace. Brace yourself, preachers, for the rejection, the despisings, the cruel, merciless underminings. Even from conservatives, brace yourself if for the rejection, the despisings, the cruel, merciless underminings that I guarantee you are coming, even from deeply conservatives, who you don't just toe the line and bow to with dot and tittle. Brace yourself. You know, when I was a boy, these days it doesn't shock, but those days, one of our friends was kicked to death very mercilessly and violently by what they called uh, duck tails. Hmm. The rebels without a cause, that generation. Mercilessly kicked to death. We were all boys when it happened. But they got off scot-free. Scot-free. Just as cruel as those boys were are evangelicals worldwide. If you just touch them, whether it's their carnal compromising or their methods that you dare not challenge that are wrong, their standards. You will be branded, you will be undermined, and you will be crucified by them. Brace yourself as mercifully as that little boy was kicked to death. They got away with it, but wait until you stand before Christ. Oh. Beware of Christians who are hypocritical. That word is so close to hypocritical. It's fearful. Beware of people who are always looking for the speck in other people's eyes when they have beams in their own eyes that are doing such damage to true Christ-likeness. It's unbelievable. People who try and catch you at your words to destroy you have beams in their eyes, sir, when they can't find anything what they're going to. They're waiting. Like hawks, like spiders. <laughs> you know not what manner of spirit ye are of. The Son of Man has not come to destroy men who aren't exactly like you. Where do you think it's serving God to destroy people? because they're not exactly like you. Brace yourself, preachers, for rejection, persecution, the most unexpected sources. How oh, I did not preach that. Hmm. When the fires come to such a degree that you believe you will not survive, Brace yourself. But always remember when thou passest through the fires, they shall not burn thee. Through the waters, they shall not overflow thee. God never promised you 
that you won't go through fires in this world. In this world, you shall have tribulation. That's total onslaught from Satan, but always from the most unexpected sources, always. Otherwise, what can it do to you to shock you or stagger your faith? But when you pass through these, I will be with you. Hold on to the promises. You know when Peter sunk there in the Sea of Galilee? You know why he sunk? He turned and looked at all the devil. The Bible tells us Satan created that storm. Right there, God was with him. But Satan created a storm that filled his heart with fear. And he walked, he lived in the, he did the most miraculous thing that's beyond our comprehension as Christ bid him come just to show him what can be done. But he began to sink. You know why? The moment he took his eyes off Jesus and looked at what the devil was doing. Sir, there's no physical Christ to look at right now. But you look at Christ one way with that book open. And you take the promises, that's keeping your eyes on Jesus. And they will always be there that the sovereign God will hold out to you, preacher. Your darkest moment that God allows, God will be doing a work in your life or he wouldn't be allowing it. Read Bill Gothard's biography. It's just come out a year ago. Read the last chapter that he writes to those who did destroy him. I thank you, he said. I thank you. For without what you did against me, no matter what it did to my ministry, I needed it for God to reveal things to me that I would be eternally grateful for. So I thank you. Your darkest moment, God's doing his greatest work, or he wouldn't be allowing it. You just keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep this book open. And that sovereign God will have healing through the healing word of God. That's all it is, the promises of the healing word of God. They're like plasters that you put over the wounds. You will be wounded. You will be wounded. You will, oh, you will be wounded, but you will be healed, that the wounds will not fester, that bitterness will not come. Anger, like Bill Gothard, you'll be like Jesus, sir. You might come to a place where you long for death, you won't be the only one. Jeremiah, look at what they did to him for being doing what God told him to preach. <laughs> what did he say? Let me die. You weren't the first preacher that ever cried, let me die. No, Ezekiel, Job, Jeremiah cried it from their hearts. Oh, did I had wings as a dove that I might fly away. It's escape all this. I once said to one of the godliest men I ever met in my life, the great Lex Buchanan, I wish I could die. He said, no, Keith. That's the easy way out. You've got to live to let God do in you what he's allowing it for. Pass the exam in the school of God, Keith. Your darkest moment. Don't ever doubt it, Keith Daniel. But God ever allows in your life. God is doing his greatest work in your life. Or it wouldn't be happening. Preacher, be careful of wanting to die before God. You see, though he slay me, Yet will I trust him. You've got to trust God no matter what comes. Not only when everything's perfect, but then everything's fine. You've got to know that these things come against you. Well, brother, I knew a man whose son drowned. I've known many, many people whose sons were killed. I've been in a home where entire family was wiped out as I stood there. And I saw a father and mother get on their knees and say, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name for all they said, no. In all this, they sinned not, nor charged God foolishly with their lips. Not only Job passed the exams. Where his son drowned, tragically, the man of the home was so crushed mentally that he took a gun of Last year and the year before, 
and for quite a few years there was a family that aren't here this year, the Lancasters. I've been in their home, I've preached in their community, and they're a lovely family. About two years ago, their son Timothy drowned. Well, they were hunting, hoping they'd find him somehow, but the last thing he was seen was in the water of the lake. The mother called all the children, the large family, and said, Neil, yes, Neil, now, every one of you, I want you to pray to God and to tell God that you're not going to be angry if Timothy drowned. You're not going to be angry with him because Timothy's gone to heaven and this is the perfect will of God if it happens. Every one of you pray for it. You see, there's two ways of facing tragedy. I mean real tragedy. <sighs> Thank you, God. I will not be angry with thee for allowing these things. You deal with things that come on you very differently. There's a boy in this meeting here tonight. Dr. Greer's son. Paul, we sat with him. They didn't think he'd ever speak again. The cancer. The but you know what he said? His mother said this is me. When he really wasn't known whether he would die, it was just hanging on in a terrible state. about what he was facing. It isn't what I would have chosen. It isn't the way I would have chosen. But it is good. You see, God allows things. And all things work together for good, sir. Oh, God lied. If you keep your eyes on him, though, Spurgeon, regarded as the greatest preacher in the history of the church, whether he is or not, I do not know for sure, but by the multitudes of denominations of evangelical movements, this is the man regarded as the prince of preachers, all preachers in history. He said these words before he died, if it wasn't for the fires, if it wasn't for the trials, if it wasn't for the sufferings, if it wasn't for the tragedies, if it wasn't for the persecutions, the underminings, the onslaughts of hell through the most unexpected sources. I would be in poverty as a preacher. poor in the pulpit. How can you weep with those that weep if you have never wept yourself? How can you comfort others in any real way if you have cannot comfort them with a comfort wherewith you are comforted? I think that's why he was the greatest preacher that ever He didn't allow these things to destroy him. They made him what God knew he would become, no matter what came against him in his ministry, for always from the most unexpected sources. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Show me a preacher that doesn't say that from his soul, and he shouldn't be in the ministry if he's been in the wild. His grace that led me thus, safe thus far, grace alone will lead me home. Cast yourself on grace. It's about all you're driven to do through life, you know. Cast yourself on grace. 
but do it. And let him defend you. He will. And even if you perish, Daniel's friends, he's not failing you. So don't you fail him if that's the way you have to go. But don't deny or compromise what God wants of you as you perish. Can we stand, please? One meeting left. One meeting left. Nine o'clock. We sing. My son will preach. And then I will close the meeting with a message. And then we leave this place. Changed or hardened. No matter what the consequences. Father, take this word, protect it. by the Holy Spirit and in mercy to any heart that needed it. Please don't let it be rejected. embraced and lived that this world may be staggered by a true servant of God according to the scriptures no matter what comes against him in Jesus Christ's name Amen